Hello, my name is Ian Amit, and today we're going to talk about defense. A little bit of background before starting with uh, talking about defense. Um, usually I get asked why would you even talk about defense. Most of my career and uh, research has been focused mainly on offense. As such, uh, I get to encounter a lot of our clients where they've had a vulnerability assessment and maybe even passed a pen test. Um, and at some point, they actually think that they're, they're fairly secure. Uh, but what they actually get from such a, an assessment or a pen test is mostly compliance, but not really a lot of security posture, and we'll see exactly why. Um, in such cases where we actually run a red team, which is a full scope assessment of, uh, of the organization, um, we tend to find a lot of issues that weren't found before in a vulnerability assessment or a pen test. The reactions that we're getting for most of them vary from a little bit of shock at the beginning uh, because they thought they were protected and, and compliant, um, maybe some denial afterwards. Um, most of them say that you know we didn't play by the rules or we found issues that weren't in scope. Sometimes a little anger um, because obviously it, it kind of points back at uh, systematic issues at the security posture of the organization. A little bit of resistance where fixes have to be made uh, in order to fix all those uh, security issues that we found. Uh, and once in the blue moon, we actually get acceptance where people say, you know what, this has been great. You found all the issues. We're going to address them in, in, in a systematic way and root them out of the, the organizational uh, issues. Well, the point is, I think, uh, when, when I look at uh, a methodology of defense, is that we've been doing this wrong for, for a very, very long time. Uh, and we've been practicing attack and defense for a long time, uh, but defense hasn't really changed uh, over, over the, the past few decades, I would say. This is the defender's view as we most often see it. Uh, we put on firewalls and antiviruses and other products that m basically mask our ability to look at uh, the enemy or to anticipate the enemy or to have a clear view of, uh, of the battlefield, of, of, of what we're trying to protect. On the other hand, uh, when I'm looking at it from an attacker's perspective, the attacker still has the full scope, it still has this, uh, the full view uh, of the target organization. It can scope out and see what the defenses are. Uh, it can see patterns in terms of how the defenses work and basically plan the attack very specifically for that organization. This is how it looks like from a, from a methodology perspective. Uh, an attacker has the full scope from intel gathering to vulnerability research, um, which leads to the actual exploitation based on all the data that was gathered before, and then establishing command and control and performing some post-exploitation work such as exfiltration and continued uh, exploitation of internal network. On the other hand, when we look at it from a defensive point of view, We've been focusing mainly on detection and then mitigation and containment, uh, which is only obviously only part of the, the spectrum that we should be focusing on. And today we'll try to see what elements have we been missing in terms of a, a proper defensive scope. Uh, it starts from a proper threat modeling to understand who our threats are and uh, why we should protect them, uh, as well as what are we protecting in the first place. Uh, we'll talk about intelligence gathering, uh, just like an attacker performs intelligence gathering uh, on its targets, we can perform intelligence gathering based on our threat modeling. We'll move on to data correlation, uh, and we'll see how a lot of the data that we already have at hand today can help us uh, narrow our scope or, or focus more on the, the actual relevant threats that, that we need to deal with, and then we'll lead on to detection and then mitigation and containment. A few things to remember, it's not about egos, people, or skills. Uh, much different than attack, uh, defense is a very, very hard job, and it needs to be right all the time, and it just cannot. Uh, hence the it's not fair statement. Defense is never fair. Attackers always have the upper hand in terms of their ability to evade the law, to bypass laws, and not to, to have complete disregard of, of uh, legislation and, and limitations while we as defenders have to abide by some kind of set of rules, ethical rules, corporate rules, as well as uh, state of federal laws. 
Um, being a defender is about having a mindset of constant improvement. It's about understanding that we're, there are always going to be gaps in our defense, and it's our job to identify them, remediate them in the context of the risk, uh, which means not just blanket patching everything that, that comes out, uh, but really focusing on what we're trying to defend, what's the risk uh, of said vulnerability or patch, and act accordingly. The first step in, uh, in implementing a proper defensive methodology is, is basically mapping. Uh, and the first thing in mapping is really understanding what is the business doing anyway? Uh, how, are, how is our business making money in the first place? What are the critical assets? Uh, what are the processes that support uh, this business organization? Uh, who are the key individuals? Who are the key people that support the, those processes? And then move on to what technologies support uh, this money-making process or, or critical assets that we hold in the organization, as well as third parties and other elements that, uh, that have some kind of relationship to the process or to the assets that we're protecting. Further along, after we've mapped out the, the, the business aspect and the, and the assets, we map out our security controls and then intelligence assets. Usually, I say, you know what, you already have a lot of those mapped uh, anyway. You had all those vuln assessments and penetration testing and maybe even red team assessments uh, already in report format. So work up from those. Uh, while weeding out their relevancies, weeding, weeding out the, uh, the elements that, that matter less in the context of the assets that you're trying to protect, uh, and this will help you start off a, a proper mapping of your business processes and security controls. There is no magic solution to, uh, to mapping. Um, I usually say, you know, start with a whiteboard, uh, work with Visio or even Paint or whatever supporting element uh, that works best for you. And remember to, to keep a lot of key individuals involved so you'll get the full picture from multiple points of views uh, in order to get as close to reality as possible. Uh, and again, remember to map out everything. Processes, people, uh, third parties, technology, vulnerabilities, security controls. So you have a clear map of how an attack would take place or what happens when an attack takes place. And, and at that point, we'll start to think like an attacker and identify where are those key assets located? Who are those key assets? Uh, what kind of vulnerabilities are around them? Or where are the controls placed? So uh, I can try and see if there are other paths that bypass those controls and, and exploit other vulnerabilities. The last stage of, of mapping is really mapping threats. Um, a business needs to identify who is out there to get them. Um, who are their threats? Is it script kitties? Is it random hacking? Is it competitors? Is it nation states? Uh, it could be a plethora of, of uh, threat categories, and this really needs some involvement from the business. So I would suggest to sit down with uh, the CIO, the CEO, uh, most importantly, the CFO, they know a lot about uh, risk, uh, financial threats and, and how to address them and where they're coming from. Then we need to identify what are the capabilities of those threat communities, we call them. What do they know? How is this business or organization is perceived by them? What kind of information or intelligence they can get uh, on our organization before they attack. This is very important to be able to understand what kind of capabilities and modus operandi or, or, or way of operation those threat communities have. Uh, an internal threat will have a completely different MO than uh, anonymous, which will have a completely different MO from a professional hacker hired by competitors. So it's very important to identify those elements. The next step is intel gathering. Uh, once we have a threat, uh, threat mapping, we can start gathering intelligence on our organization as well as on our uh, threat mapping elements. And intelligence can come from a lot of different places that are often overlooked in, uh, in our daily job. Um, some examples are sales and marketing and business development. These are elements in the organization that are exposed to a lot of external information, a lot of external data, uh, and a lot of interaction with competitors, with peers, with customers, with partners, 
And, and a lot of that data can be translated back into intelligence for our defensive security. Take a look at competitors, at partners, at customers directly. Uh, you'll find out that there are a lot of ways to open communication channels with those, uh, even though there, there might be competitors, uh, in order to, to share intelligence and gather intelligence uh, at the market level to understand what kind of threats does, does the market uh, face. Talk to analysts that specialize in your market. Uh, they'll be able to tell you again who are the competitors, what, what are the, the motivations for, uh, for threat communities to attack companies in that specific sector. And the obvious ones are, are certs that specialize in computer emergency response, uh, and then general market news and forums that might lend to uh, some information about attacks that are uh, pending or any kind of, of trend that might indicate uh, an upcoming attack. Also look at early warning signs. And, and this is something that we've been, we've been doing fairly well in the past few years. Look for weird behavior on the network, on, on PCs. Uh, look for changing file permissions. Uh, look for volumes of, uh, of calls to the support center, um, at people hanging around the office, sales inquiries that seem a little too intrusive, and check out the website logs and see who's, who's been poking at it and what kind of information is being, is being gathered from it and at what frequency. A lot of those elements can, can again, lend back to getting a lot of intelligence uh, to build a clearer picture of what kind of threats we're facing and, and uh, whether those, those threats are imminent or not. Last but not least, people. Uh, we always say that uh, there is no fix for, for human stupidity. Well, there is, uh, and it's called persistency and education. Uh, once you educate people about the dangers of stalkers, tailgaters, uh, once we educate them about social engineering and uh, people smoking in the smoking smoker areas trying to tailgate their way back in, um, once you educate them about uh, probing inquiries from sales leads and, uh, and IT issues that, uh, that the support department uh, are handling, you'll see that people will be much more aware and will communicate back to you elements that uh, have, have been often overlooked in the past just because of that awareness. Uh, and it's your job to translate those alerts and, and indications to, uh, to intelligence, whether it's actual or, uh, or just you know, uh, random data that might be overlooked at, at some certain point. And then most importantly, it's correlating. Correlating all of that data that we've gathered so far, correlating all the intelligence uh, that, that, uh, that we've analyzed uh, on top of local news, port, entertainment, financial news, regional, national, international news, everything that might have any impact on a data element in the context of such news. Uh, for example, if there's a, an oil rig uh, that is leaking in, in, uh, in an ocean, uh, yes, you might expect phishing emails to start uh, coming up with pleas for, uh, for supporting the... Um, with pleas for supporting the save efforts uh, or, or for helping out uh, the ones that, that get hurt uh, from a, an environmental perspective. And, and the list goes on and on, and, and a lot of those phishing campaigns can be tracked back to, uh, to relevant world news. And finally, it's acting. Uh, it's building up the defenses, the defensive mojo. It's training people, as I said before, to identify, report, and react to security-related events. Uh, and yes, it's about also combining technology into the mix. Uh, but note that this is kind of a last uh, phase in the methodology and not the first one. Technology is not the solution. Uh, methodology is. Uh, and finally, it's working with others. All that work that you've been doing, other people have been doing as well. Um, and so there's no point of reinventing the wheel when you can share that information and share threat intelligence with, uh, with others, peers, vendors, intelligence sources, and even governments. Uh, uh, set up certs in a way that would help private companies share information and get information back from the government from those certs uh, for relevant threats. 
Now, in order to really act up and, uh, and build a defensive uh, strategy, you need to first assess where you are, uh, whether you're at the beginning or somewhere in the middle in terms of, of the implementation of a, sec of a proper security strategy. Um, and lying to yourself isn't going to make you feel better, uh, at least in the long run, uh, which means there's no point of hiding behind uh, vulnerability assessments that show up that everything is clear if that's not the case. Um, it's about getting a third party or an independent review of your security posture to make sure that everything has been scrutinized and you get a real clear picture of where you're at. And again, it's about constant development. It's about expecting changes. The, sta the, the, the status of the organization as you mapped it out is never going to stay the same. Um, processes, partners, customers, third parties, uh, services and products, people and culture change constantly. Uh, so never sign off of a status uh, or, or a map of how the organization is built and what kind of defenses are, are built into it and, and, and what kind of assets we're protecting because they're always going to change. So make sure that you keep up to date with those changes and uh, adapt to those changes to make sure that you are applying your defense strategy accordingly. And of course, align outwards. Compare notes with peers. Keep track of what's new on the offensive side. This is what we've been doing for a very long time. For example, in security conferences, we've been updating people on what's new from, from uh, the attacker side so they can prepare for it and build their defenses uh, properly. Uh, just make sure that you understand how it relates to you, how it affects you specifically, because not every new offensive technique is relevant to what you're dealing with in your organization. Never accept a successful audit or compliance uh, to regulation as a sign of effective defense. Um, an audit or, or especially compliance uh, is basically geared to make sure that you are as good as the lowest common denominator um, in your industry. And that's not really where we want to be. We want to make sure that we are ahead of the game, that we're uh, on top of, uh, on top of our, our security posture. Uh, and that is far beyond what compliance usually requires from us as an industry. And once you have the basics built out, you can really start building additional elements on top of it, such as counterintelligence. Part of gathering intelligence uh, based on the threat modeling and identifying the threat communities is really owning up your information and, uh, and getting deeper into understanding who your adversary is and actually affecting how they operate in order to better your security posture uh, or even avoid attacks from those, uh, from those adversaries. So you can set traps. You can set intelligence and technology traps uh, to prompt you whether those adversaries are starting to target you. Uh, you can booby trap tools uh, while working with law enforcement uh, and, of course, your legal department to make sure that you can get a head, heads up alert uh, when attackers are trying to use those tools to attack your infrastructure. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so get proper legal advice. This can get really complicated, especially when we're talking about computer security related legislation um, in an international aspect. Uh, so make sure that you are compliant with your local laws, your federal laws, as well as international laws that uh, affect your counterintelligence operations based on where you're located where, and where your uh, counterintelligence operations are taking place. And as I said before, that's the place where you can start fitting in technology uh, and find technology elements that work for you, or make some. Um, SIM and SOC are, are the trivial solutions that we usually start with, uh, and then we look at other correlation engines to, to see how all that data can be correlated and applied correctly to our organization. Um, we need to feed the technology all the data that it can handle, and even a little bit on top of that. Um, everything that can be relevant and that can be correlated later on should be fed back into those correlation engines. Uh, financial information, semantic data, Google Alerts, anything goes. Uh, whatever you can feed into uh, back into a correlation engine, 
the better. Uh, the worst case scenario is that you'll feed garbage data and you'll have to deal with uh, weeding it out from the correlation. Which leads us to finally uh, uh, finding a, a proper use to uh, last year's fad of big data. Uh, and big data in the defensive methodology posture is really all about getting useful information uh, from a lot of information sources. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm re-emphasizing feed as much information as possible. Uh, and yes, that includes semantic data, that includes loosely typed data uh, that should be correlated over a timeline and, uh, and trying to find patterns over time between different data elements. It could be uh, firewall logs in financial news and Google Alerts and uh, forum information that we're scraping for, uh, for metadata and, and semantic information. All of those can form a really clear picture of an imminent attack or someone trying to scope us out uh, if it can be correlated correctly, hence the use of, of big data technologies. Let's take a quick look at uh, some counterintelligence use case. Uh, and I'm going to show an example where uh, we've had a problem with, uh, with a financial institution that had uh, dormant accounts used for fraud and, and money laundering. So what, what we've been uh, identifying in terms of the MO of the attack uh, are, attacks, are sorry, accounts that have been lying dormant for over a year, uh, have been used for money laundering and international transfers, uh, while the source of, uh, of the transaction is really unclear or, or the actor is unclear uh, whether inter it's internal or external. So what we've been doing uh, in terms of counterintelligence and trying to identify where that problem uh, started from is we've actually created some uh, similar dormant accounts that, that we are controlling and we are tracking inside the network. And we've, putting the, we've put them in a list uh, and placed them in different areas of the network uh, relevant to different departments in our organization, marketing and accounting, uh, and as well as some, some of the branch uh, management networks. At some point, we've identified an internal user that was accessing one of those uh, uh, lists and, and uh, trying to, to gather those accounts probably for malicious use. Again, remember, these are fake accounts that we have intentionally placed inside the network. They're not, exist, they're not existent in the backend systems and they're only used as a bait. Once that user has touched that, that uh, booby-trapped so-called list, uh, we get an alert and we can start tracking down uh, the activities of that user. And uh, as part of, of the forensic investigation or par as part of the the defensive work we've done around that, we've identified that the PC uh, contains a, a Trojan after uh, examining the, the actual PC content. Um, and that Trojan is communicating back to a command control center in Eastern Europe. Uh, that's where the bad guy is probably connected back to the command control center. And we were able to work with law enforcement to apprehend those, uh, those attackers. Last but not least, play, play nice with others. And I can't stress it enough. Uh, cooperating with certs, governments, peers, and even competitors can really bring out a lot, of, uh, a lot of good to your security strategy. Because again, you're not facing this by yourself. Other people and other organizations are also facing the same kind of problems and have been finding different solutions than yours uh, over time. So it's only, it's, it, it's, go it's only going to be better for you to cooperate with them and learn from their experience and also teach them uh, some of your experience uh, and share, uh, share your defenses and strategies so they can also help themselves. Last few words, uh, and again, the whole is greater than, than the sum of its element. This is very basic, but it really applies to, to defense uh, even further. Especially when we're talking about element, uh, uh, defense that involves a lot of different elements from human to technology to physical uh, to intelligence, um, especially in those cases, each individual element uh, cannot be defended or cannot contribute to the whole defense strategy by itself, uh, as well as if we integrate all of those together and correlate uh, the information and, and the behavior between those elements.
a little call for action uh, for us defenders as well as to vendors. Uh, if you're a defender, own up to your data. Uh, own up to the network, to, the, to your business organization, and see how you can apply different techniques based on what you own and what you control in order to get a better view of, of your adversaries. Gather intelligence on your potential adversaries. Make sure that you're up to date with what they're doing as well as they're as much as they are on what you're operating in. Focus your defenses on assets, not compliance or best practices. This is what you're up to protect. You're not uh, protecting the legal department, you're protecting the business. Um, add the legal department later so you can make sure that they're also compliant and, and as, as, as well goes to financial and other elements of your organization that need to be compliant to some kind of regulation. And last but not least, take the initiative. Uh, there's no point of sitting around waiting for firewalls or IDSs or antiviruses uh, to notify you that you have been breached uh, because usually that means you've been breached for a very long time. Take the initiative, gather intelligence, be proactive about it, and make sure that you're on top of your defensive posture. Back to the vendors. Uh, I kept mentioning the traditional defenses, the firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, and, and AVs. How about start work, starting to work on products that communicate with information rather than technology? Uh, try to focus on loosely typed data, as I mentioned before. It's not all about packets and bits and bytes. Uh, it's sometimes also about behavior patterns. It's sometimes also about semantic data that can be gathered and need to be analyzed um, in the context of a threat model. Uh, look for language processing of arbitrary data formats, um, hence forums and, and news, news alerts. And finally, and really the, uh, the most important part, is correlate. Correlate across as many sources as possible and across time, over time, to make sure that uh, an incident or an event that happened three weeks ago and another event that happened last week and an event that happened uh, in, the, in the past hour can be correlated and strung together to something more coherent than just individually uh, individual events in, in the timeline. This is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Thank you very much and see you next time.